right. So we're here with uh, Yaniv, the CEO, founder of Mohawk Group. Uh, pleasure to have you on here today. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you have a lot going on, clearly, um, over the last 12 months, really, right? Uh, we're, we're kind of lapping some of the early start of the IPO uh, and getting kind of to the other side. And a lot of it's taking place in the company. Um, today, what I wanted to do with you was, was really cover really five, six main topics. The, the management team, kind of your origins there, the product itself, maybe giving us some insights into uh, kind of what is Mohawk Group, right? I think uh, there's this misconception sometimes that um, uh, Mohawk Group is one, first a flooring company, which is clearly the other uh, company that is out there. Um, yeah. and, then, and then two is just understanding the dynamics that are taking place. Your go to market, your growth drivers, uh, your competitive advantages, and, and at a very high level, just the general public information on, on economics um, sure. that, that we see out there. Now, I'll first start off with a, a uh, disclosure statement. Um, so this presentation is for informational purposes only. No information contained on this presentation constitutes investment advice. This presentation should not be considered a solicitation, offer, or recommendation for the purchase or sale of any securities or financial products and services discussed herein. Certain statements contained herein may be statements of future expectations, opinions, and other forward-looking statements that are based on Avery's or Mohawk's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially. Uh, and by full disclosure, Avery is an investor in Mohawk Group, ticker MWK, so please reach out to Houston Hess, our head of compliance and operations, for any further information on that if required. Um, so yeah, let's kick it off. I mean, just give us the origins of yourself, kind of uh, your backstory. I think that's a, a good place for everyone um, in the market to to really understand your backstory, how you came about of, of Mohawk and, and how you established this team. Sure. Well, again, thanks so much for having me and uh, the, the opportunity to, to talk about the company. Uh, um, you know, my background, um, I'm originally from Israel. I moved to the U.S. Uh, approximately 13 years ago. Um, I have made my career in technology. I, um, you know, since uh, pretty young age, been interested in technology and, and programming. And, uh, you know, uh, in my adult career, I've been running technology at various startups, uh, bigger companies. And I uh, founded Mohawk with two other founders, also from a tech background, uh, six years ago in New York, um, which really is interesting. We, you know, we are today a very interesting company, a hybrid of a technology and a consumer product company. We, we really started this without having too much experience with consumer products, right? We, we came from a tech background. What we realized, uh, I think back then, almost six years ago, was that as retail was moving to online and as companies uh, like Amazon and Alibaba, technology companies were reinventing the online retail store, um, the consumer product companies that would want to be in those retail stores, the traditional ones that we've used to see in, 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 in brick and mortar retail, were just not really equipped to, to, uh, to be uh, successful on these platforms. And what we asked ourselves back then was, um, what was the consumer product company of the future going to look like? What was the next big conglomerate of consumer product uh, that, that generates billions and billions of dollars of revenue? Uh, would look like if it was born today in the day and age of Alibaba and Amazon. And, um, you know, we believe that that company will, will look a lot more like Amazon or let's say it will be more of a tech, as much as a tech company as a consumer product company, right? And that's really the vision we set to build with Mark. We set to build a platform for consumer product uh, um, launches and, and management on e-commerce marketplaces. We strongly believe that e-commerce marketplaces whether it's Amazon or Alibaba or, uh, you know, Rakuten in Japan or Flipkart in India, we strongly believe that the marketplace business model will drive the majority of, of online retail in the future. And, you know, Mohawk is really built to be the ultimate consumer product company for marketplaces. Um, a lot of people ask me, why is technology so important? Why is it that you need to have your own proprietary technology to be successful in these futuristic platforms of retail? Well, you know, the way I think about it, uh, the, 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 the marketplaces really present a challenge for traditional brands because they really kind of level the playing field by making it available to pretty much anyone to go and create a brand and, and sell it on Amazon or on Walmart through their marketplace portals, uh, really kind of creating, uh, again, this level playing field where 
uh, with the event of online and the, the ability to go uh, through companies like Alibaba to reach manufacturers in China and make products, anyone can go compete against the traditional brands. We believe that uh, with this, to, to, to really kind of like get above this level playing field, um, it's all about efficiency. It's all about efficiency of the supply chain. It's all about understanding the customer and predicting their needs. It's about being able to uh, turn data into products in a very rapid way to meet the consumer demand online. And so the reason Mark is a, a technology company and a product company at the same time is that proprietary technology platform that we're building that we call Amy allows us to really inject technology through the supply chain, starting with the market research phase, what, you know, bringing in all the data that we can from every source that is available out there to build models that predict and find opportunities in the marketplaces and tell us where is it that consumers are not happy with the product that they find? Where is it that they're looking for certain things or there are trends that are happening that uh, you know, traditional consumer companies are not rapid enough or not attuned enough to, to leverage? And then the combination of that technology and the data with an agile supply chain allows us to turn those insights into consumer products within six to eight months and take market share from the incumbents at a very fast pace. We believe that what we build is again, the ultimate consumer product company for marketplaces. And we're just very, very early stage in our opinion as to the size of the market that we're after. So that's the background story. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's obviously super impressive what you guys built. Um, now, the thinking of Amy, right? Uh, I think when most people hear Amy, they think of, uh, Maybe it's very similar to something like a Jungle Scout or a Helium or, or, or some of the other tools that like a single seller will use. How are you guys different? How, how is Amy different? I know you just said you take data uh, from other sources. And I think that's by itself different uh, from those, right? Usually those products are tools to find uh, or, do, or do your research to find products on these marketplaces, but they don't really span across other uh, data sources. So kind of how is Amy different? Maybe I'm... I'm I'm putting that on the stick for you, but uh, in general, how, how do you say it from from your point of view? Sure. First, I'd say you know the, the technology companies you mentioned, uh, like Jungle Sky, they're, they're very good companies, and they make very good tools uh, that are very helpful for uh, I'd say the large majority of, of third party sellers on marketplaces like Amazon. Uh, you have to first and foremost understand that they're catering to the Enormous. I mean, there's like probably like approximately three million active uh, third-party sellers just on Amazon, and those are all small businesses, right? That that drive revenue. I mean, the large majority of them don't even run a million dollars in revenue, right? But that's the beautiful thing about the marketplace is that it allows all these small businesses to take part in this new economy of online. And the tools that uh, companies like Jungle Scout and Hill Tem have created are great tools for for the small businesses to understand the market, to find uh, niches and areas where they can. Uh, you know, find products that they can make and, and uh, you know, and, and I have only good things to say about them. Uh, our ambition is to really, uh, if you will, you know, take that, take that model of those small digital native brands that are agile and data driven, but run it at a scale that's, that's much, much larger, right? I mean, we, we really are aiming to, to become, a, you know, a, 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 over time, a, a multi-billion dollar revenue company, and we want to manage thousands and thousands of products across many different geographies, right? This is why I said we're still kind of early, but we're moving pretty quickly. And to do that, the, those tools, you know, are, are going to come short at some point, right? Because what you really need is you need an end-to-end -end solution that has a kind of like almost a, a source of data underlying it through the whole supply chain, right? The tools you mentioned you know, their Jungle Scout is a great tool for, for uh, market discovery, right? But it, it's not a full suite of solutions that allows a company to scale to the level that we want because it doesn't include the entire uh, uh, logistics uh, uh, optimization. It doesn't include the optimization of your inventory levels. It doesn't include the fulfillment capability. Our software, our Amy platform is, is really built, it's a cloud solution that, inside of it contains many, many modules that drive different parts of the supply chain, all cohesively to give you a full picture of what's going on in your business and help you optimize it. I'll give you an example, for example, on the um, marketing engine that we have, right? I mean, I, I believe that we have one of the most sophisticated automation uh, of marketing available today for on marketplaces that we use for our brands, right? And part of the intelligence we're trying to build, part of the operating leverage we're trying to build is we're trying to basically teach, teach our systems how to make decisions for us, right? How to 
how to decide what to advertise uh, currently given the market condition, where to spend the money of the marketing, how, what price should we have at any point in time? Um, and, and, and those are, there are other tools doing that, right? There are other tools doing that, uh, like, uh, you know, other tools kind of like Jungle Scout that do it in a vacuum. But the problem is that if those tools are not connected, for example, to your supply chain, they could make the wrong decisions. I mean, an, an example would be, say you have a great automation marketing engine that has discovered a way to increase your sales by 20, 30%. That's great. It, it obviously sounds like an incredible achievement, but what if your containers just get stuck in uh, the port and, and they're going to be two two weeks late and now you're running out of premise that you have enough inventory, but in fact you don't, right? That's the kind of level of, of, of intelligence we're trying to build here. And, and, and it's this kind of cohesive view of our entire supply chain, of our entire business to make decisions that are at the level you need to do them if you want to build, again, the size of company that we do, right? So I'd say again that these tools are, are are great for smaller type of businesses, but we're we're trying to build something that is a lot more ambitious and and of a scale that uh, you know none of the marketplace sellers today is at, right? So, got it. So so let's let's start there. Let's go to let's start on a product, right? And I think let's go rapid fire kind of an example how you got to that uh, product category. Um, uh, maybe those two, and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep going from there. Sure, sure. Yeah, so what, what are we looking for, right? When we talk about uh, capturing data from the different marketplaces and analyzing it to, to figure out uh, what what, uh, what products to make. I mean, to answer that question, I think one of the fundamental things that uh, I think a lot of, of, of people who, despite being kind of like users of, of, of Amazon and Walmart, um, you know, don't really kind of think through as much as we do because that's our, that's our livelihood, right, is is, is um, the the way consumers are, are searching for products and the way they shop has dramatically changed with online. And it is specifically around the fact that consumers have become very data-driven, right? If you think about it, if you go back in time before we had online shopping and, and the internet in our pocket in the form of these kind of incredible phones that we carry, right? Um, you know, we didn't have much data and we, we were walking into a store uh, to buy anything, you know, the only thing we could rely on was, was the brand that we've seen on TV and, and, and the image of the quality and perspective that, that those brands have given us, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that, that was really the only data we had, and that's what we relied on, right? You fast forward to today, and, and it's incredible to observe how consumers are shopping, you know, and this is really the data that we're looking at, right? One of the most fundamental things that, that is always, always uh, mind-blowing to me when I think about it is that the searches that consumers are performing on Amazon today, 75% of those searches don't carry a brand name in them. What does that, what does that tell us? That tells us that consumers are empowered by these platforms to, to go and do their own due diligence on finding solutions to solve their problems. So instead of saying, I want uh, you know, uh, 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 a Frigidaire dehumidifier or uh, you know, a, a Whirlpool uh, washing machine, right? consumers are going to go look for best humidifier for basement, best washing machine for small spaces, thousands and millions of, of, of different queries. And, and they're going to basically look at the reviews. They're going to look at the price point. They're going to look at the features of the thousands of products that are offered to them. And they're going to make decisions based on data. And so to, to go back to your question, what do we look for? We look for, first and foremost, what is it that consumers are searching that they're not finding? We are basically, in a way, retracing the millions of searches that consumers are performing on these platforms and analyzing the results to figure out where is it that there is uh, a lack of customer satisfaction, a deterioration of ratings, uh, uh, not enough choice, uh, new features that uh, all of a sudden seem to be trending because they appear in more and more products showing on the search. Those are the things we look for. Those are the kind of signals that are telling us, hey, oh, there's an opportunity to get into this market because the data shows us that what consumers are looking for is not matching what's out there, right? And then from there, um, you know, um, the, the, the answer is always going to be, how can we do better, right? How can we be more customer centric? How can we bring a product to market that could be just iteratively better? Maybe it's maybe maybe for example, in a certain category, none of the products really appeals to customers because of uh, you know sometimes as simple as the packaging is not uh, is not good enough, and, and it and the, the items get damaged uh, when they get shipped, or sometimes. It could be that uh, simple things like the cord is not long enough, or I don't like the fact that it makes so much noise, right? And we take all these soft touches 
And we, through that data, basically build a model that says, can we make a better product? Can it be a good business for us? And then if it, if it seems that financially it is a good business, we would take that data to our sourcing and, and quality control teams that are based today in Shenzhen, uh, and we will ask them to go work with the contract manufacturers on, on potentially building a better product, right? And again, if we can do that within six to eight months, we bring the product to market and very laser focused go after what is it exactly that we saw in the data the consumer wanted. We go and advertise specifically to the path to purchase that was uh, not really meeting the customer's expectation with the uh, with the um, uh, goal of, of, of taking market share by appealing to the customer uh, with a better product, it's as simple as that. Which is what I love about our model is at the end of the day, our model works uh, if we're customer centric, if we put all this effort to understand what can we do better for the customer as opposed to you know what could make us, I'd say, maybe the most money initially, right? So. Um, that, that's our approach. I mean, they're, pretty much all of our products have a story, right? Uh, you know, if you look at things like, uh, to take an example, for example, we sell a commercial ice maker. A commercial ice maker is a very large uh, ice making machine that you would probably find typically uh, in gas stations and, and pools. And the, the story, for example, behind that product is that we noticed that in general, at a macro level, more and more customers that in the past used to uh, not feel comfortable buying oversized and very expensive items online uh, are now starting to feel more confident because they're buying pretty much everything online. And so some of them own businesses and maybe you know, their, their commercial ice maker failed uh, in, uh, in their gas station business or their pool or whatever it is. And they might uh, first and foremost say, let's see if Amazon has it. Let's see if any one of the places where I shop for my you know, regular day-to-day -day things has it. And we've seen a trend where more and more people are looking for these items online. And as you can expect, because it's kind of a nascent trend, there are less competitors uh, out there benefiting from that, right? And so um, part of, part of one, another, another part of the solution that, that we've built through Amy is we've built an optimized fulfillment and shipping platform for oversized items. So these two, uh, these two kind of uh, um, uh, data points converge into a very good opportunity. On one hand, you know, a nascent growing search with not a lot of options when it comes to that particular commercial, industrial type of items. And on the other, a fulfillment platform that we built to be able to ship oversized items more effectively. So that was, for example, a great combination of, of data points that allow us to bring a part to market to uh, appeal to customers looking for this type of item. Got it. Yeah, no, that's a good example. I know you guys just launched a range hood. Um, and if you look on Amazon, anybody uh, on, on the uh, Home Labs brand, uh, you'll see that that's a successful product launch, uh, at least from the perception from the outside, just seeing, uh, get, getting the little ribbons that say Amazon's uh, kind of pick and kind of a hot item, whatever the actual term is. Um, I think that's a good example of, of taking kind of some of these commercial products, moving into the home, Home Labs, and, and, uh, and I got more topic on that. But um, going like second... On, like iteration on the the product side, so there's two aspects to it. You have, and you've eloquently stated this previously, is you you've had around 140, 150 employees, kind of over the last year or year over year, right? Last 12 months, the, the 12 months before that. Now, trying to understand um, your model that you, you're building, how you're able to be that efficient uh, in launching new products successfully. I think you have an 80% success rate of product launches around there. Um, and you have kind of this consistent uh, employee base. And it's trying to understand at the, so two things is at the launch of a product, it's the human element, right? You, you're getting in debt, ingesting all this data that is give, feeding you kind of places to potentially create product. You have a product uh, or an employee base that's becoming more and more efficient, which from an economic standpoint makes uh, a big difference. Um, but then you have potentially this human element. And I think that kind of goes unnoticed sometimes is to create a product, there's generally speaking, I mean, if it was just robots uh, essentially assigning products and, and creating products, um, I think that becomes a commodity in a sense. But if you have a human element attached to a data engine, I think that's really where special companies are created. How do you guys think about kind of the employee base, the efficiency gains you're doing there, but also the human element in product creation? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, um, it, it, it goes without saying that um, our employees are uh, 
are just a formidable amount, bunch of people, right? They're, they are, um, they are the company and the, the culture of the company is, is above everything else, what drives it. And the, the, those employees are either building technology or building supply chain or, or building uh, the product themselves. And our goal as a company really, and, and the reason we believe that what we're building is, is the future is to empower them, right? Like we build technology to turn every one of our employees into a superhero, right? We want to, we want to, we want the people in our marketing team to have the tools and the, the systems to be able to do what people in other companies, uh, you know, you would need like 50 people, like, you know, to, to, to be able to do the same thing. Right. And, um, you know, that it's very, very important to understand that our culture is people first. And, you know, part of one of the mantras that we have is if you do it twice, automate it, right? So we, we from day one, tell our employees and, and people who join us, our goal and the reason that we have technology in-house is to give you a promotion, is to allow you to come in, identify problems, solve it, and then work with our technology team to automate that so you can go on to the next problem and to the next problem. And that's how, you know, we think of technology in-house. But first and foremost, none of it will be possible without our team. And, and it's really the combination of the two elements, the ingenuity of, of, of our team and uh, the ability to automate the tasks and, 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 and the things that they do on a day-to-day, -day, right, that, that creates that operating leverage that we look for. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, for us, we want to be the most efficient consumer product companies on, on, online and on marketplaces. <clears throat> and it's just exactly that. It's the combination of hiring the right people, First and foremost, building a, a culture of innovation, of a culture that that uh, of driving forward and sustainable growth, and beyond anything else, right? The, the ability to kind of like take that uh, innovative uh, approach that we have to this business and and use technology to automate it as much as possible. Yeah, no, I always think of the analogy. And first off, you should make a shirt for, with uh, your your slogan um, and probably sell that. Um, <laughs> we, we other companies that uh, do uh, smart things like build the viral adoption there. But the the uh, think of Salesforce, right? The, the CRM empowers the salespeople, right? Uh, this is, uh, in our opinion, potentially internally at least at this point, is uh, a, your own internal Amy product powering uh, the product developers and creation and marketing and research and 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 and, and obviously the list goes on. Now, one question we always get, and we asked actually, we went out to. Uh, mm -hmm of the world and, and, and ask people to, to, to kind of bring up, drum up questions. And, and one question we always continue to, to see is the diversification risk of Amazon. Now we have our own opinion um, and we, we've, uh, you take the analogy of uh, Amazon AWS, right? And, and they actually want the snowflakes to build on top of them. They want these companies to build on top of them. Um, now on the, on the commerce side, we think it's the same story. They, they want to be the platform. Um, now, this is a common question that we get. What is your view on the risks of, of Amazon, let's say, just moving into private label, which, again, is a small fraction of what they do, um, but at the same time, just getting a, an understanding of your, your, your own views on, on Amazon as a, as a clear partner, but also someone that is a uh, potential threat? Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, you know, what, what I always... Uh, uh, Sometimes when people ask me about that, I, I refer them back to um, a letter that Jeff Bezos wrote to shareholders uh, a little over a year ago, where he was specifically speaking about the success of third-party sellers on the platform, right? I mean, if you look at the history of Amazon becoming a marketplace, Amazon started more of the retailer, and today, 60% of all the sales on Amazon are driven by third-party sellers on its marketplace uh, uh, business, right? And uh, that's a pretty incredible number. I mean, 60% of uh, $300 billion uh, GSV uh, business run by, again, millions of small sellers. That's uh, no small feat. I mean, in, in my opinion, by the way, that insistence on becoming a marketplace was probably one of the most genius plays that, that Amazon came up with. Um, and and, and is a, it, it's, to my, you know, it, it's not being said kind of officially, but my perspective is that Amazon, and in general, I think most retailers are going to become marketplaces over time, and they want to be them. And they want to be marketplaces, right? And there's several reasons for that. Um, and, and, and I start with a couple of them, right? One is, um, you know, there, there's a formula in e-commerce that drives your success uh, as a business, right? And it's the formula is uh, CAC LTV, cost of customer acquisition, lifetime value. A, a very smart thing that Amazon has realized 
many, many years ago is to be the leader in the space, they need to build a, a lifetime value of customers that is as big as possible because that would allow them to spend a lot of marketing to acquire the customers to come to their platform. So this this kind of like concept of how much does it cost you to bring a customer to the door and how much money are they going to spend with you in your lifetime is really the golden equation of, of, of e-commerce. And what Amazon realized a long time ago is to, to have the highest lifetime value, to be able to really have a lifetime value of a customer spend $2,000, $3,000 a year on average with them for literally maybe 10 years, right? They need to basically have in their store every product on earth. That's what they call themselves the everything store, right? Because if you never shopped on Amazon and, and, and you get drawn into Amazon and you buy a certain product, you put your credit card in there, you just bought something, chances are you're never probably most likely going to buy most of the things you buy on Amazon going forward because it has every product on earth. Now, having every product on earth sounds really good like a slogan, but it is extremely challenging. I mean, and I think that what Amazon realized a long time ago is that it's it's actually almost to a sense impossible for one company to source and and and, and manage, I mean, a hundred million products almost, right? And, and it really... What, what they did was brilliant as they said, well, you know what? Let's just outsource that to millions of third-party sellers who are going to use their own balance sheet to source products, put it in our warehouses, although they're not going to be on our balance sheet, right? And then they're going to be managing the listings. They're going to write, instead of have, us having a, an army of copywriters that have to write every listing and optimize them, they're going to do that for us, right? And we're going to charge them a fee for it. So it is the key to their success is their ability to mobilize millions of sellers that have basically put on their platform every product on earth. And that's why Amazon is so sticky. You just don't have to go anywhere else. It's all already there because millions of third-party sellers have already done the work of sourcing those products and bringing them to market. Now, that strategically, it, it seems to me pretty evident that, that not just Amazon, but around the world, if you look at the leading retail platforms, that's the model they're going through, right? And so if you think about that, you, you realize there's a symbiotic relationship. Amazon wants a third-party sales to be successful. And that's exactly what Jeff Bezos says in the letter that I mentioned. He says, he says in the letter, approximately, right, I'm not going to have the exact quote, but he says, look, third-party sales have done really well because we have invested and, and, and put enormous amount of effort into giving them the best possible tools and the best possible uh, access to data and, and, and capabilities so that they can be successful on the platform because there's a symbiotic relationship. Their success is, is, is Amazon's success, right? And in fact, I would say that I, my, my prediction is that in, we'll see in the next um, five, 10 years, uh, kind of like this competition between Walmart and Amazon and Wayfair and all these retail platforms uh, as to who is going to be able to provide more data, more systems, more capabilities, more automation to its third-party sellers because it is a way for that platform to retain their attention, to make sure that they spend more time sourcing products for Amazon as opposed to Wayfair and vice versa, right? So when you go back to your question, right, I, I again, I, you know, to, technically speaking, yes, you, you are relying on an existing platform. I think today, you know, if you, if you do any business on the internet, you rely on Facebook, Amazon, Google, or, you know, uh, or Apple, right? But, but, but beyond that, I think the symbiotic relationship and the importance of the third-party seller ecosystem for Amazon is absolutely critical. I mean, it's, 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 it's vital for them to be able to drive more third-party sellers to come to their platform internationally and bring more products so they can continue to retain the advantage. And we see that in day in, day out. They invest in more APIs, more tools, more capabilities for sellers like us to build the type of systems we're building with Amy, to, to build the business that we're building, right? So, um, but what I tell people is, you know, look at look at the interests of, of, of both sides and you'll see that they're very aligned. You'll see that uh, Amazon specifically is consistently trying to do everything it can to help its ecosystem of sales to grow with it, to go with it internationally, to expand uh, with Amazon's expansion. So, so therefore, you know, at a high level, you know, I, I I, I, I don't see Amazon as a, as, as, as a, as a, you know, a, a, let's say a frenemy from the perspective that they're looking to just, uh, you know, use us in a way, right? Now, we've got one last question on, on, on the private label side, right? Um, you know, the, the private label of Amazon, to my knowledge, if you exclude Alexa, because I think of Alexa as a very unique uh, uh, product, represents approximately 1% of the entire 300 billion of, of GSP that happens on the platform. My, my perspective is simple, right? I mean, it, first of all, if Amazon gets to 
that would be a feat, the incredible feat on their end, right? And 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 maybe they would like to do that, right? But remember, it's a marketplace that grows ten to twenty percent year over year. And it's already at three hundred billion, and they only own one percent of it. So even if they get to ten percent, I would gladly be, you know, we would be very happy to be the second biggest, uh, you know, third party sellers on their platform. There's billions and billions and billions of dollars to go after here. And remember, we're not limited to Amazon. It's true that Amazon represents a large majority of our sales today, but that's just because of the reality in, in the US, right? We also sell on Walmart and we'll continue to sell on more channels in the US, but our, our ambition is to take our model and as I said, expand it to other countries like India, like China, like, like Japan, right? And we're still very early stage to do that, but, but in those countries, there are different players. Rakuten in Japan and Flipkart in India, are again going back to what i said we want to be the leading company when it comes to selling our marketplaces and um you know we think that the symbiotic relationship between marketplaces whether they're amazon or these other companies and the sellers is is really built for that got it cool yeah so so what we know so far um is you're using data to find product gaps um on a marketplace which is predominantly brandless with keyword searches driving uh, results. You have 90 plus products in the top five or so uh, of product of, of search results, probably growing obviously through acquisitions, through uh, 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 new product launches. Um, we know that a lot of the marketing engine is automated. Um, you have 144 uh, or whatever, uh, 150 employees that stayed constant for a year plus, even though revenue has grown, grown 100% roughly year over year um, or 100 million. Um, talk about growth drivers. Um, I think one of the things we appreciate about the story is we have this, the, the concept around optionality, right? Um, so some of the products you've developed now or you've acquired have potential to become brands. Um, Home Labs, for example, Spiralizer, Peerstream, two of the one, ones uh, organic uh, to our acquisitions, great names, marketing. Um, Right now they're brandless, right? But when we think back of like, let's say Anchor, I think people uh, forget to think about the Anchor story where I think it was 2000, what, uh, maybe five years ago. Uh, they started out as an Amazon seller, um, exclusively on Amazon. Now they sell through many parties. They're a billion dollar company as a standalone brand. Um, we think there's that potential optionality in some of your brands, right? I'm following your Instagram and I see Home Labs consistently posting and having the shop tag. Um, has its own website. I think it's powered by Shopify. Um, so there is that optionality. I don't know how you guys think about it. So how, how do you think about uh, kind of the commodity brands where you're actually just doing volume and scale versus ones that you can turn into an actual brand and go from brandless to brand to kind of mass market um, through the brand? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Uh, first of all, Anchor Anchor is a great company, and and you know they actually started nine years before us. Uh, um, and uh, they've executed really well, right? I mean, they, they've, uh, they've done a great job. They're very, it's interesting. They are uh, a little more, I think, um, R&D oriented on the product, right? And, and have uh, executed really well on, on a kind of similar strategy than ours, but with the advantage of, I think, for them being um, uh, very R&D heavy on the products and very good at making very good products. So, you know, kudos to them and we think highly of them. Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, if I look at everything we've done, you know, just like every other company going pretty quickly and growing, we've made mistakes along the way, we fixed them. But overall, I'm extremely, you know, I'm proud of, of what we've achieved. We've done a lot of things in the last six years. I mean, we launched, um, you know, hundreds of products. We, we've, we've built uh, uh, multiple kind of subsidiary businesses around that, plus a platform that I, I, I am very, very proud of. So it, it's a lot to do uh, for anyone. And, and, and again, I think uh, the entire team should be very proud of everything we've done and, and, and you know, been able to also turn just to be that positive uh, in the last uh, couple of quarters and continue to grow at a, at a rapid pace. Uh, a lot of things to be proud of, but, but there's still a lot to do, right? And for example, you know, some people always ask me, do you think that brands are dead? Do you think that, uh, you know, this, what you're doing is basically means that brands are dead? And my answer is absolutely not, right? And I think that, the fact that we haven't emphasized that, we haven't, quote unquote, built brands is, is just because uh, I, I think speed and execution and the opportunity are, are, are so big around our model today that we're going to continue to go as quickly as possible around 
that very mathematical approach that we took, right? Oh, the statistical amount of people that look for this is such and the distribution on the pages like that. And we could get into that page and take this couple million dollars of revenue. That's how we think today. But you will see that evolving, right? I mean, for me, I think as long as we're customer centric, as long as we don't lose that mentality of being data driven, customer centric, understanding the customer and building the right products for them, which is to me the core, right? A lot of people go build a great brand, but then, you know, they don't really think about the customer as much. They don't really build, you know, in, in a way that we do, right? And so for me, the core of it is to stay true to that, to stay true to what the data tells us, to what the customer tells us and build great products that customers like. We already see a little bit of that. You can see in, in our own analytics, you can see our brands showing up as things that people search for, right? Because I guess, you know, we've, we've, we've sold so many products. We're in millions of homes already with our unknown brands in a way, but consumers are happy with the products and they might come back and start searching for them. So it's a little bit more of an organic brand building. But, you know, there is definitely going to be, as we scale and as we grow, as we have more resources, uh, this this idea that we'll take those brands and make them more, uh, make people more aware of them, get, get them uh, to have more of a character and, and profile and, and adjusting to what our audience tells us they should be, right? So we're absolutely going to invest in that over time. It's a gradual uh, investment given you know, all resources and, and focus, but you will definitely see that happening. And you know, at the end of the day, why not have both, right? If you're really good at the data and at the execution, the agile supply chain, and you're extremely consumer centric in your ability to bring products to market, if you can on top of it, put the brand ethos around it and build uh, a, a real kind of like excitement for the brand, you get the best, best of both worlds. It's pretty much the cherry on the cake, right? So I think that, you're seeing an evolution. You're seeing us going after uh, a thesis that, uh, again, I, I think we've executed quite well on and it will continue to be very true going forward. But you will also see that over time, we, we will start building those brands to be a little more traditional brands, right? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and to continue on the growth drivers, I'll summarize some of them for you. But the platform approach, obviously, is uh, uh, kind of exposing your, your software to potentially other third parties, you're, you're kind of in that phase now. I know you guys hired someone to essentially lead that kind of um, sales effort. Uh, you guys have shown some traction there, uh, but again, there, there's optionality on the, on the software platform side. On the international side, I know uh, Amazon is exposing plenty of their, um, the key thing there is they're, they're allowing you to transfer or at least expose your reviews and open up to international markets. That is something that I think it started happening at the beginning of the year. Um, which right. is why we have 90 products with X amount of reviews and uh, I forget the exact uh, review count on average uh, and, and star rating. Um, your international expansion should be easier uh, by the lens of having clean product position here. Uh, maybe give us a, the, the elevator pitch on the international opportunity. Yeah, maybe let me, let me, I'll get to that, but I'll answer also your question about growth factors because I, I, I realized I didn't do that right. But really, you know, we think of ourselves as a platform for consumer products and we have three kind of business models, if you will, on it, right? Like the core business model drives most of the revenue is build, right? Like you, you identify what the data shows you and you build, right? What you've seen, I think, uh, recently is we, we've invested a lot in the buy, right? Which means when our data shows you an open space and you can build a product, that's what we do in our core business. And, and what we've started doing is when we see that the data shows us that there is no opportunity to build because the incumbents are strong and it doesn't make sense to go after them, if those incumbents are digital native brands, there's the opportunity to acquire them in a very creative way. So that's going to be another uh, a driver of growth, very important driver of growth for us in the, few, in the next few years. And, and you've seen it in the last deals and we're going to continue to do it. So, and the third one that you mentioned, which is very nascent, is the idea to offer the platform as a pure service, right? Without necessarily buying the companies. We've had some traction with it. Uh, we, we've hired, as you said, someone new that, 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 that came in to lead that. COVID was a little bit of kind of like, uh, 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 stop everything uh, for, for a lot of companies not wanting to take any new kind of like initiatives and, and we're now kind of like a tail end of it seeing again some 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 good interest around that and we believe that long term that will be another kind of uh, leg to our business um, and, and so those are kind of like the three factors now going back to internationalization right this is another example of Amazon looking to incentivize its ecosystem of sellers uh, to, to, to focus on it and to, to spend more resources on it. And, and what you mentioned is a really interesting development. Amazon is trying to become a more international platform. And one of the things they've done is they take 
took the rating systems and they made it international where, you know, if in the past the product that was launched in the United States and has done really well because consumers like it, uh, if you launch it in the UK, for example, on Amazon, you would have to kind of like rebuild your, your, your ratings and your social proof uh, locally, right? One of the things that Amazon has started doing is, um, you know, products that are now uh, sold in the US or in other, in other Amazon uh, localities and are moved to another uh, Amazon uh, geo will automatically benefit from the ratings um, across all geos where there's translation happening on the fly through Amazon software for the local uh, uh, um, uh, customers, right? Which obviously is, in, is, a, is a huge advantage, right? As, 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 uh, and it opens up a, a, a the door, as you mentioned, right? To a very important part of, of 2021 is going to be that international expansion to capitalize uh, on the fact that we are able to squeeze a lot more value from the portfolio of products that we have today by expanding internationally and reducing the, I'd say, um, you know, initial investment that you would have to make to promote your product and drive it by basically benefiting from those from, from those ratings from day one. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it's, it goes to the, the next um, kind of section, which is competitive advantages. And, and one of them is, is we have the concept of digital real estate, where each kind of product listing you have isn't as durable as the beachfront property, but it is, uh, you, you can make it as durable using kind of um, different techniques, right? Whether it's marketing or product enhancements. Um, but it's really that ratings, reviews, and, and listing is, is really that reinforcement vehicle. Um, so when you think of uh, that concept, um, and as time goes on, how do you guys think internally of, of just maintaining that leadership position as, as other platforms are gunning for the top spot as well? Yeah, this goes again to, uh, to, to the concept of uh, marketplaces for traditional retail, right? If you think of it, you, you said it really well, right? It's, di it's, it's digital shelf space, right? zero, digital real estate, right? If you think of in, in traditional retail and brick and mortar, what would give you the, the, the shelf, the real estate, was how strong your brand was, how, um, how much you were spending on TV, right? Uh, and I think one of the most incredible things that online and Amazon and, and other platforms have done for customers is that they've changed that from basically a merchandising team decided what's going to be on the shelf, depending on things like branding, to the customer being empowered, where really what drives your position, that real estate that you mentioned, right? How do you protect it? How do you own it, right? You really, it's, it's, it's all the customer, right? It, it's about the performance of your product. If your product continuously performs well across many metrics, right? It's availability in stock, it's uh, pricing competitiveness, it's uh, rating by customers, right? As long as those metrics and, and many others, right, remain strong, your and customers react well to your product as they go to the digital shelf. You you can you can sustain it, right? You can you can basically if you ha if you own it today and you continue to maintain your metrics in terms of customer satisfaction across all these variables, right? You can continue to maintain that real estate now. What becomes challenging is, you know, as you scale, how do you make sure you don't run out of inventory? You don't have a problem in customer service around a certain product that you're not seeing, right? You don't have a competitor that's trying to undercut you on a particular shelf where you're not noticing it, right? And this is why, again, technology is so important, right? To monitor all these things, to make sure that either the system reacts automatically or at least alerts the team that some there's a deterioration in one of the metrics. We need to do something about it, right? And, and again, it's the reason why. All these third-party sellers, um, you know, that, that reach 10, 20, 30 million dollars in revenue, kind of hit a ceiling. There is it, it's because again, it's it's becoming very, very hard to monitor all these variables across all these digital shelves uh, if you do it manually, right? And and so going back to the investment in technology, another aspect of it is, is to again make sure that your performance, your control of the shelf, your at the end of the day, your your ability to satisfy the customer is there, right? And and, and I think. Going back to strategic advantages, I think that what we are building, what we've invested in the last six years, gives us that uh, the capability that not a lot of other companies have. Right. Yeah. No. It's really reinforcement. Is is kind of how you got there. Is is how you can stay there. Um, the kind of conclude on on the economic side. Um, obviously, the just looking at the overall economics, how they've shifted over the last twelve months, been pretty dramatic, um, both on the top line and the bottom line. Um, also, in terms of uh, the capital position, I think uh, both of those are uh, are testament to y y your team's doing. Um, 
just walk us through how you think of product launches, just contribution margins, all the different metrics that you, uh, how do you want the, the, the uh, investor base to think about how you think about uh, the economics of the business? Sure. I think first and foremost, one of the challenging things for a lot of investors to wrap their head around when it comes to our business is that because we work through such a variety of different products uh, in different categories, you know, a lot of investors come in and say, what's the gross margin across the products? And, and, and it's a challenging question for a couple of reasons. First, gross margins in, in beauty or in, uh, you know, uh, appliances uh, and everything in between can be very different, right? So when you look at a, at a merge, you know, gross margin across all these different categories, it's something challenging to understand where, where it lands, right? On top of it, another thing that makes it very challenging is that um, because of the dynamic nature of the business, because of our ability to change price all the time, to, to, to uh, play with the different variables to get the best, I say, performance, right, for the products, uh, you can also see shifts in the gross margin that might seem unreasonable to some people, right? This is why one of the things we try to constantly tell uh, investors and, and it really kind of like one of the sacred words inside of our company is contribution margin. Contribution margin is really all the costs associated with launching, uh, sorry, with, with selling a product uh, every, for every transaction, uh, excluding fixed cost of, of people, et cetera, right? So everything that goes into returns and discounts and uh, advertising costs and shipping and other fees, all of that is, is built into that PL of the product. And what we always look at is that contribution margin at the bottom, which uh, at a minimum has to be 10%. And today hovers, between, you know, at average around 15 and can sometimes go up to 20, right? Now, the reason it's so important to look at that metric is because, again, with the, na the, the, the nature of this real-time ability to change uh, all the variables, you can have situations where uh, you have a product that sells for a certain, uh, you know, price. And, uh, you know, it's been doing well, but you, by experimenting, you realize that if you lower the price by, say, $5, right, all of a sudden, your entire uh, reaction of customers, your conversion rates, your click-through rates improve dramatically, right? And so your contribution margin might have improved a lot. Your gross margin just got deteriorated because you lowered your price. And so I think one of the challenging things for especially consumer investors to wrap their head around when they think about us is they think, look, I mean, in, in retail, you have to have a certain gross margin, otherwise you're not going to be profitable. But, but what we are, are kind of like disrupting a little bit in, in, in our approach is to say that's not entirely true. Because of the digital nature of our, and our ability to control things in real time and experiment with things, you know, we could find ourselves that degrading the gross margin actually ends up with more net, right? And, and, and sometimes even vice versa, right? So um, that's, that's, I'd say, one of the key things to think about. In, in terms of uh, how we think of launching products. So first of all, you know, we, we, we're, we're looking to launch uh, 10 products a month uh, next year uh, in average, right? Sometimes it might be a little lower, sometimes a little higher, but in average around 10 products a month um, with, with the intentions of bringing them to market um, and, and, and going after, again, our model of finding those, those opportunities and, and, and get the products to stick into that category, into that digital shelf for a very long term. We always go after products that we believe have multiple years of profitable uh, revenue generation and we are staying away from anything that's fashion or anything that is uh, could, could be irrelevant within a year or, or something like that, right? And so the way we approach things is we run a model that tells us, look, if we, we find an opportunity to enter the market, we believe that if we invest this much in marketing during the launch, we would get to a particular velocity. And then at that point in time, we can uh, bring the product to, to a certain profitability and stabilize it there for many years to come, right? And so we, we think of it as phases. We have a launch phase for a product, which can take up to three months. Typically, it could be much shorter, depending on how effective our marketing is. During that launch phase, we allow ourselves to be negative contribution margin, meaning the product might be in a negative uh, cash flow in a, in a way during that period, because what we're doing at that point in time is we're overspending in marketing to capture market share, right? We're all about going laser focused after what we saw in the data, capturing that shelf. And if we've done our job well, which statistically, you know, in the last 24 months, we've been on around 80% success rate, the product makes it to where approximately we want it on the shelf. And then from there, we stop that overinvestment in marketing because we're no longer in market share capture. We're now going into what's called sustained phase where the product has to provide at least 10% contribution margin, right? And, and, and again, depending on all of our metrics, that contribution margin might improve over time if we really did our job well, the quality is good, consumers like the product, and, and, and everything's good. If the product hasn't done well, um, say, say it's actually falling into a 20% failure, 
that typically means that the ratings are not good enough, that consumers are not happy with it, and we can't get to approximately 4.3 star average rating. And at that point in time, two things might happen. Either we can understand what went wrong, fix it, and probably relaunch the product. Or if really we believe that there is not much else to do, the product will go to liquidate, right? Um, and, and that's all right because you know it's part, part of this is you, you can't have it 100 percent right. I think 80 percent success rate is incredible for for this for this industry, and um, it's important to understand that the investment we're making in inventory when we bring a product to market is 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 uh, one that is not uh, you know so so large that 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 we that we are losing a lot of money because of it. Right, we're doing this in a very iterative way. We're going after just enough inventory to make sure that our thesis is right and then follow behind it to continue to maintain the position if you want. Perfect. Yeah, no, I think, um, so, so first, we've covered a lot. Um, uh, very full from, from product to, to go to market to competitive advantages to the overall economics of how this all works. I think one thing people are uh, is right in front of our eyes is each product that's successful in landing with contribution margins of 10 to 20% continue to de-risk the portfolio of products, um, right? So we're building layers and layers and layers of, of, of products that are then each product has a less uh, importance to the overall pie. Uh, and I think as that happens, um, at some point, uh, it may be too late and, and, and people are doing it, th or you're doing it through acquisitions and you're doing it organically. So you have these two mechanisms. At the same time, you're becoming better and better at this, right? So there's a compounding nature. So the core of the business is, is, is extremely strong. Uh, it's getting stronger day by day. Uh, it seems like the last 12, 12 months has uh, really been an acceleration in terms of um, product placements and, and therefore cash flow. At the same time, there's the optionality concept that we were referring to before, where um, obviously it's up to you and the team to determine kind of directionally where things go and, and executing on that. Obviously, you are where, where you are today due to execution. Um, but I wanted to summarize there and basically put it in a nutshell of how we're thinking about uh, this digital real estate concept or digital shelf space and taking that share and, and, and all these companies trying to build platforms or companies on top of the platform of, of Amazon and other marketplaces. So with that, I want to do obviously thank you for spending some time with us um, and explaining honestly full, uh, uh, the full uh, rationale behind um, why anyone should look at, at Mohawk and, and just uh, acknowledge the, the, the recent and historical success you guys have been doing. So appreciate you coming on and, and, and we'll talk again. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate the time. Take care. Have a good one.